Okay, hello. Thank you for showing up on this very cold day. Um, um, okay, first of all, I have um, one announcement, which is that I'm gonna have to cancel my office hour tomorrow. I don't, I hope no one was planning on coming to that. Um, but, um, and I also, I think I forgot to turn the Zoom client on today when I was in my office. I hope no one, no one tried to come to chat. <laughs> but anyway, um, normal office hours will resume next week. Uh, there hasn't been a crowd of people coming to office hours, so if you want to come, <laughs> uh, be my guest. All right. Um, okay, so I'm just going to start talking about the. There's more things I didn't say about the second meditation, but whatever. All right, I'm good. I just have to go on because there's not enough room to talk about the third and fifth meditation in one lecture either. <laughs> so, um, right. So obviously I put the third meditation and the fifth meditation together because they both contain proofs of the existence of God. Um, and I've been doing that for a long time. I think when I first started doing that, I was like, yeah, I don't know why the fifth meditation is, you know, should be next to the third meditation. <laughs> I'm going to teach them together. The 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 longer I've been doing this, the more I've realized that that's a complete mistake. That of course Descartes has a reason for putting the fourth meditation in between the third meditation and the fifth meditation, and that moreover, the main point of the fifth meditation. The main point of the fifth meditation is not to prove the existence of God, even though that's most of the text. <laughs> um, and the third meditation, although the main point of it is to prove the existence of God, it has a lot of other important things in it. It has more points than just that. So I keep thinking maybe I should split them up, but the problem is I already don't have enough lectures, so <laughs> I'm keeping them together. Um, this year, usually I do a Tuesday, Thursday schedule. And this year I was like, didn't realize until the last moment that, oh, there's gonna be two Monday holidays during the quarter. And I had to like further glom some other stuff together <laughs> other than separating things out. Um, anyway, I mean, uh, if we were doing it in the right order, so, like, basically, I think I mentioned this before, but now maybe you can start to understand it better. Like, in the first meditation, there's, um, there's, a, there's a bunch of stages of doubt, right? Like, first, there's the, the doubt raised on the empiricist basis of knowledge. And then there's... Well, I mean, that is first the empiricist basis is stated and a doubt is raised about it. Then the rationalist basis is stated and a doubt is raised about that. The doubt that's raised about that is God might be a deceiver. Or I might be caused by something even less perfect and therefore even more likely to be deceived. Um, there's an attempted answer to that, which um, is, well, but, you know, since God is said to be supremely good, he wouldn't deceive me. Um, to which the meditator at this point replies, um, well, that proves too much, right? This is a form of argument that's often useful but it's especially helpful here and it, it, it's useful because you can show that there's something wrong with your opponent's argument without finding any particular mistake <laughs> right so you say so in this case the the right the, i don't want to spend too much time on this but this is important right so that the objection is well but god is good right so he wouldn't be a deceiver and the response is proves too much because it appears to prove that God would never let me be wrong about anything.
right? If I'm saying since God is supremely good, uh, he wouldn't uh, make my nature such that I that I uh, always go wrong. You might think, well, then he wouldn't make my nature such that I would ever go. But of course, I know that I sometimes go wrong. And again, the reason I know that I sometimes go wrong is that my old beliefs were not consistent. <laughs> so at least some of them are wrong. <laughs> so for sure, uh, God has sometimes let me go, go wrong. And that doesn't show that God isn't good, but it shows that if God is good, that's consistent with God letting me go wrong. I don't know how. <laughs> Right, so it stops this objection without questioning the premise or explaining why the premise doesn't yield the conclusion. It just says the premise can't yield that, the conclusion you want because if it did, it would yield this other conclusion, which we know is false. So, um, so that this the second meditation, you know. Uh, provides this new basis, right? The, the cogito is the basis. And then after that, we basically go backwards through this stuff. <laughs> um, so it's like the third meditation um, proves that God is good and therefore not, maybe it's not exactly backwards, but the third meditation proves that God exists and is supremely good and therefore is not a deceiver. I mean, there's definitely something to be said about why a perfect being couldn't be a deceiver. Descartes just says that's clear. Um, I think there probably would be something to say about it. I mean, uh, uh, something like Kant's derivation of the prohibition on lying from, from having a universal will. No. This, this perfect being can't have any um, private incentives because it doesn't need anything. All right, but anyway, never mind that. So God is good and therefore not a deceiver. And so um, uh, what about this? Doesn't that prove too much? Doesn't that show that I could never be wrong, which we know is false? And that the fourth objection is going to be the answer to that. I'm mean, sorry, the fourth meditation is going to be the answer to that, right? That is the fourth meditation takes on the problem of if God is supremely good and if not a deceiver, how could it be that I ever go wrong? And moreover, which things could I go wrong about? So that's what we're skipping, right? Then, so that like is against this. Then the fifth meditation, the main point of it is to rebuild this. And finally, the sixth meditation is gonna, of course, not exactly rebuild the empiricist basis because Descartes not an empiricist, but it's gonna explain how we can know that the world that we usually think of, of knowing through our senses exists, right? That, that there is a world of bodies, that I have a hand, that I'm really sitting by the fire, et cetera. I wish I was sitting by a fire, but anyway. <laughs> okay. Oh, um, uh, Right, so the main point of the fifth meditation is actually um, achieved at the bottom of page 106. Um, it's AT page 65 in the middle, um, where I don't know if there's anything that I could really read, pithy thing I could read here, but the conclusion at, at this point is that. Um, that the, um, when I think about mathematics, when I think about geometry and arithmetic, I'm, I'm thinking 
And so that is when I'm thinking about what in the first meditation, the meditator called the, so to speak, true colors out of which the world is going to be uh, composed. Um, that, that when I think about those things, I'm thinking of something real. I'm thinking, tr I'm using true ideas. It's, I mean, uh, uh, this only, this already is a reason for this to be after the third meditation because that only makes sense in terms of the apparatus of ideas and terminology about ideas that is introduced here. But because it doesn't mean that, that there actually is a triangle, for example. There probably isn't a perfect triangle. But it means that uh, my idea of triangle, as Descartes is going to put it, and hopefully I'll get to explain this in detail, that as Descartes is going to put it in the third meditation, that um, my idea of a triangle has objective reality. That is, it's capable of representing an object. An object, so to speak, exists in it in object form <laughs> although that there may be no corresponding actual object actual thing right so um and that's the very thing that in the third meditation descartes uh denies about literal colors or at least says i guess at this point in the third meditation doesn't deny it he says that I can't even tell if these things represent any reality or not. Um, that's on page. Ninety three, I guess. He talks about heat and cold here, not about color, but presumably the same thing applies to color. Um, for example, the ideas which I have of heat and cold contain so little clarity and distinctness that they do not enable me to tell whether cold is merely the absence of heat or vice versa, or whether both of them are real qualities or neither is. Um, and since there can be no ideas which are not, as it were, of things, if it is true that cold is nothing but the absence of heat, the idea which represents it to me as something real, right? And again, always remember that real means thing, thing, <laughs> right? Because this whole thing is thing, right? So represented me as something real and positive deserves to be called false. And the same goes for other ideas of this kind. So, right, so what he's showing in the fifth meditation is that the, the um, so to speak, true colors of the world, that is extension and its modes <laughs> are real, true ideas. They, they, they represent something as having objective reality, even though, uh, the literal ideas of color and cold and heat and whatever are, are not, right? So, um, and that, uh, that enables me to say that all the things that I thought I knew about triangles and whatever are true. And then as a, like, um, and therefore all the things I thought I knew about bodies regarded merely geometrically are true. Um, right, so this is the rationalist basis for knowledge about the corporeal world. Um, uh, then, as a kind of afterthought, the meditator says, oh, hey, wait, if I can trust proofs, then here's another proof <laughs> that God exists that works kind of like a geometrical proof. And so the conclusion is that even if the other stuff that I've done before has a mistake, at least the existence of God is as certain as a theorem of geometry. That's the way the meditator puts it at that point. 
So what that means is that, that Descartes thinks that this proof is not as good, actually, as the third meditation proof. Right. I mean, this proof is as certain as geometry, but geometry on its own without the third meditation is not entirely certain. There's a slight reason for doubt. Right. So that so Descartes thinks that the the proof in the third meditation or the two proofs, it's kind of two proofs, but they're very closely related to each other. The proof or proofs in the third meditation are the really good proofs and this one is kind of like hey but here's another thing I could do even and it's although it's not as good as this it's at least as good as the proofs that are trying the ang angles of the triangle add up to two right angles um okay so um so that's as far as what the fifth meditation is actually about <laughs> um as for the third meditation, as I said, it is really about the proof of the existence of God, but um, it spends a lot of time introducing um, Descartes. Now, of course, Descartes didn't in introduce this term, idea, right? It's from, it's in Plato. <laughs> um, it's a right, it's a Greek word, but then it was like used in Latin after that, whatever. Um, but so, but Descartes is introducing uh, the exact way, what he's going to mean by idea and um, um, what what an idea is, what the difference between different types of ideas are, what kind of causes ideas have to have and so forth, right? A lot of the third meditation is about that. Um, and I mean, this is important because um, uh, well, I mean, it's very important for understanding Descartes in general, but it's also very important for understanding Spinoza and Leibniz, because they're also going to take over this term, and although they don't use it exactly the way Descartes does, it's it's based on the way Descartes uses it. The way Locke uses it constantly uh, is somewhat different, although not unrelated. Yeah. This is probably too unrelated, but isn't there a point in the pure reason where Kant has some issue with the use of idea for images rather than some other thing that he, he wishes that it was used for? Yeah. So Kant. Um, so basically, the word that Kant uses, where um, where Descartes would use idea as representation, Vorstellung. Um, but I mean, for Schelling, but Kant shouldn't get too different talking all about Kant. But yeah, Kant really, although he his early works are mostly in Latin, the the later, more famous books works are all in German, but he still thinks in Latin. <laughs> so, so oftentimes he'll actually give a Latin equivalent for a German word that he uses in parentheses. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, yeah, because um, uh, Kant thinks that this word idea, and based on his interpretation of Plato, he thinks that this should be um, reserved for representations of supersensible things. At least that's one way of explaining what they should be used for. All right. So, but anyway, um, and you know, I mean, Descartes. I mean, Kant has a point. This is probably oops. Um, Descartes, and probably even more so, Locke are kind of wrenching this term out of its at least more re recent use in the like in medieval philosophy. Or, but. That's not really our problem. All right. <laughs> um, so, uh, and of course, I mean, this isn't a coincidence. Okay. It's not just like you glom two things together. The reason there's all this discussion is that the proof or proofs of the existence of God in the third meditation hinge on. Um, 
something about my ideas, and in particular that I have the idea of an infinitely perfect being, supposedly. That has to be established, right? But that's um, the, the, the proofs work off of that. Um, Okay, so like I said, I hope to get back to discuss this in detail and eminent being and formal being and objective being and all that stuff. I, I know I might run out of time, but um, I hope to. But so first I'm just gonna say something about proofs of the existence of God in general, unless there are questions of what I said so far. Okay, so, um, so first of all, there's like, a, I think I said this before, but I'll say it again because it's so important. There's like a general problem with this topic of proofs of the existence of God in philosophy. Um, it, can, it can be very misleading. Um, it can be misleading because um, So there's this human institution called religion, right? I mean, there's more than one of them, but I guess they're all the same versions of the same institution. Uh, um, I wouldn't want to have to defend that, but <laughs> they seem to be kind of. Yeah. So anyway, uh, um, and a lot of them say something about God, or a word we translate as God, right? So into English. Um, and uh, and that human institution is all tied up in politics. And uh, I mean, uh, as it has to be, because it's, it's what human institutions are like. Philosophy is like that, too. <laughs> it's also a human institution. <laughs> but, uh, um, but uh so like when a philosopher starts saying i'm going to prove the existence of god um this isn't a mistake exactly but like it's, all i can say is it could be misleading right you start like you react to it as if they're taking a position in some political slash emotional, slash, right? Like something, maybe I shouldn't use the word emotional. It does have to do with the passions to some extent, but, but political, I think, is more to the point, right? Um, and, you know, I mean, chances are that they are somehow, but it may not be the one that you, you're thinking of because, like, like, everything has changed between their time and now. So, um, um, you know, like the um, radical Protestants in the English Civil War were the left-wing radicals, so to speak, <laughs> right? They were like the anti-monarchist Republicans. <laughs> um, uh, and the Catholics were the monarchists. And I mean, that is the war was partly over the idea that Charles I was secretly Catholic, which I think we now know he pretty much was. <laughs> and furthermore, was trying to move the country back to Catholicism, which I think that is not so clear that that was true. But anyway, right. So, so, so the point is, like, um, yeah, just those things have changed. Um, so that's one thing, like, I mean, um, you have to at least try to, like, suspend associations with what they're talking about in order to under, long enough to understand the argument. That's number one. Number two is, um, you have to try to figure out what it is they're trying to prove. And from one philosopher to another, it's not going to be the same thing. And um, it may well be that they're trying to prove some, the existence of something that is uh, not at all clearly related to religion. I mean, so like, for example, Spinoza and, you know, uh, as we'll see, the first thing he does in the ethics, in the first few pages is prove the existence of God, 
So he was a notorious atheist. <laughs> Why? Because people thought that that thing that he proved the existence of was not God. <laughs> right? So, um, um, so that's another thing you have to worry about. Um, and, um, and, you know, especially because the way they choose what they're going to mean by it is basically by consulting the philosophical tradition. So, like, not by reading the Bible, for example. Um, like, if you read the Bible without knowing anything about the future history of theology, you would be hard put, to, especially the Old Testament, but uh, the New Testament, I guess, already has some Greek in, like philosophical influence on it. But uh, you, you would be hard pressed to uh, to get out of it the idea that God is uh, infinitely perfect and immutable, right? I mean, uh, it sounds like God makes mistakes and regrets them. It's angry and uh, right, like all that stuff. So, like you know. The philosophers who, the uh, Jewish and Christian philosophers who come along later and who feel in some way responsible to the Bible, you know, what they do is more or less reinterpret the Bible to make it match Aristotle, not the other way around. <laughs> A little bit the other way around, but mostly that way, right? So to match Aristotle, to match other things, like where did the idea, idea of creation ex nihilo come from? I'm not even sure really. It's certainly not the literal, the, the literal, or the, it wouldn't be easily extracted from a literal reading of the first chapter of Genesis. It sounds like there was something already there before God started creating the world, right? It says like, the, the spirit of God was hovering over the waters and it sounds like there was already stuff there. I do know at least one medieval Jewish philosopher who argued that, uh, that for the eternity of matter and said, and by the way, if you think this is heretical, actually look at the <laughs> look at the text and it supports me. <laughs> but for the most part, it was assumed that the, you know, the the correct opinion was creation ex nihilo, and then we have to somehow reinterpret these words to mean that. Um, right, so, um, um, so, in, so in particular, like, if, if you say, like, so how does Descartes know that God is infinitely perfect? Maybe God is just kind of perfect, right? Like, how do we know that we're trying to prove the existence of something perfect? Well, the answer is more or less that by definition, that is by his definition, that's what he's trying to prove. And he thinks of that as Plato and Aristotle's definition. I mean, it's anyway, the Neoplatonist definition. <laughs> that's, um, um, so uh, it's true that if he wanted to go back and interpret the Bible, he would have his work cut out for him. But a lot of that work has already been done for reasons I said, so we could kind of like ignore that. Um, in 100C next quarter, I decided I do this like every other time I teach it. Sometimes I teach the second inquiry. At the end, I teach Hume's second inquiry about morals, but sometimes I teach the dialogues concerning natural religion. So this year I'm gonna do the dialogues concerning natural religion um, where one of Hume's characters um basically says i don't like i don't understand this perfect being stuff it doesn't make any sense like what i mean by god is a very powerful being that doesn't have to be perfect but you know that's that's hume bucking the the tradition <laughs> all right anyway that's the that's kind of general intro introduction to the topic of proof the existence of god um are there questions about that All right, so the other thing I want to do is uh, introduce Kant's classification of the types of theoretical proof of the existence of God. So Kant himself thinks that all three types of proof are faulty, 
right? And his conclusion is going to be that there, from a theoretical standpoint, there is no proof. And there's only proof from a practical standpoint. It's not the same as practical proof, but but as on the way to that, he classifies the theoretical proofs and explains why they're all wrong. And the, the three types of proofs that he identifies and um, as usual, because Kant is so influential, I mean, these terms are like, you can use them without even knowing they come from Kant, <laughs> but they, they they do come from Kant. He's the one who coined them. Um, the last one, so the ontological proof, but it should, there's an ontological proof. Maybe there's only one ontological proof according to Kant. The, these others, there could be more than one type, but they, they all work, they can be more than one, but they all work the same way. I don't know, actually, maybe that's me speaking and not Kant. Maybe Kant thinks that all three of these are just one proof. <laughs> um, the last one, which is harder to say and therefore is not such a household word among philosophers, physico theological, right? This physico phusis, the Greek word phusis, is the one that was translated as natura into Latin, right? So this is like the natural theological proof. Um, the sort of Danish argument of like the end of the world did something make it? Yeah, I mean, I don't know why that's any deist more than anything else. I mean, deist is a deist is a term I find a little bit hard to understand because um, because people who definitely, you definitely want to count, count as theists, like Thomas Aquinas, you know, or whatever, um, don't think that God is very much like a human person. So, like the distinction, the supposed distinction between deism and theism might be hard to draw, but I don't know. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, so these these three, I mean, and I mean, like we might have to if if you do want to draw it, you might have to put Thomas Aquinas on the deist side, and you might have to put Descartes on the deist side too. I mean, there's other things that are supposed to make the difference, like whether there are miracles or something like that. I you know, in other words, like whether God sets the world in motion to begin with or intervenes later. But um, that also might be a little hard to understand if you look into it more. In any case, um, right, so these three proofs, so this is the, the fifth meditation is a version of the ontological proof. And it's the version that uh, Kant, well, maybe he really has Leibniz or Volz in mind, but it's basically the version that Kant has in mind when he talks about the ontological proof. Um, and this is basically a proof from the concept of God as, as perfect, right? So if God is defined as a perfect being, then it's claimed that, um, roughly speaking, therefore God exists by definition. <laughs> that's how, that's how an ontological proof is supposed to work. Um, A cosmological proof works from so so this is like from the concept of God. It's a very weird proof, Bonds. Most usually you need a uh, like a judgment or proposition to start a proof, not a concept. <laughs> right. Um, but anyway, um so the cosmological proof is from the existence of a world, right? That's why the cosmos is coming to here. Um, so the existence of a world, what do we mean by a world here? And basically, um, it's 
going to be something that's not perfect. <laughs> right? So, like, whatever we think we can show exists that's not God, <laughs> but it doesn't matter exactly what it is, we're going to argue that that couldn't exist unless God existed. So, you know, so for the meditator, of course, the only thing we've proved to exist at this point is the only thing I've proved to exist at this point is myself. So that's going to be the world. <laughs> right. Um, and finally, this one. So, you know, this is basically, or maybe this is a version of this argument. Let's call it the argument from design. Right, I think that's what you were talking about. That, like, so it's not just the existence of the world, but it's the nature of the world, characteristics of the world. Right, where so, um, like, you say, well, the world has certain features which it couldn't have if it had if it wasn't created by a perfect being. That's the goal, as. As Kant points out, and as Hume points out, and Kant is, you know, has read Hume and is thinking about Hume, uh, that's going to be a hard step, right? <laughs> that, like, no matter, we haven't seen, obviously, infinite perfection in the world. If we had it, the world would be God in it. There, I mean, there wouldn't be a world, <laughs> which is basically what Spinoza is going to say. But, <laughs> but in any case, um, for, for those of us who are not Spinozists and think that there's a world that's not, that's not perfect, there's, so there's automatically going to be a gap. That's the problem that, that this kind of proof immediately leads to. The problem that this kind of proof immediately leads to um, is the um, metaphysical problem of evil. Right. I mean, and I'll, I'll talk about this more when I talk about the fourth meditation, but, you know, there's a lot of things you could mean by the problem of evil. But in this context, the problem of evil means that there's any imperfection. <laughs> right. That's an evil. So, um, and uh, so this this proof always starts off by saying there's something imperfect. It must have has a perfect cause, but it always immediately confronts the problem. Wait, how could a perfect cause have an imperfect effect? <laughs> That's the problem of evil, right? In the, and you know the way it's going to come up in the fourth meditation, as I already mentioned, is that the imperfection the meditator knows about in the world is that I have sometimes been wrong about something. <laughs> so that's what's going to get this problem started in the fourth meditation. Um, OK, so I kind of indicated in what I just said that we should think of the third meditation proof as a version of this. I mean, it's not exactly clear, and maybe the, it's not the same for the two different proofs either. You could think of it as a version of this, right? I mean, it, it works from the existence of something that's imperfect. It claims that that imperfect thing has a certain characteristic, namely an idea of, a, of an infinitely perfect being. Um, does that make it an argument from design? I mean, it's like, well, you may say, I don't care, but <laughs> what difference does it make if, which, if it's a version of this or this? But for whatever reason, I care so. <laughs> um, the, uh, Descartes himself kind of brings this up. This is the top of page 98. Um, it's AT page 51. Um, and indeed, it is no surprise that God in creating me should have placed this idea in me to be, as it were, the mark of the craftsman stamped on his work. Right? So right there, the meditator is saying the world, that is 
me, <laughs> appears to contain the mark of a craftsman. Right, so that sounds like the argument from design. But then the next, after the dash, the next part of the sentence is, not that the mark need be anything distinct from the work itself. Right, that what's being suggested here is that somehow um, having this idea is the same as being an imperfect being of the kind that I am. That it's not an added mark. So that uh, even God couldn't create a finite thinking thing that didn't have an idea of the existence of God. That would be a contradiction. I, I maybe I'm putting more into the words that, than maybe is obviously there, but um, but and I I actually I tend towards the thought that that's what Descartes thinks and that that's what he's thinking at. So I mean you'll see why when I say more about how the the proof is supposed to work. Um, Um, so, I mean, whichever way this proof is supposed to work, um, there's nothing to work with except what's been shown in the second meditation. Right? And since either, a proof of either kind unlike this one, needs a premise. <laughs> the premise must be something that was proved in the second meditation. So the second meditation, uh, I mean, leaving aside that part about what bodies actually are, which is important, but isn't going to be useful here because it doesn't result in concluding that bodies exist or are even possible, <laughs> right? Um, so uh, leaving aside that part about what bodies actually are, the only thing that, that the only thing in the second meditation is the proof that the meditator exists and the answer to the question, what is it that I have now shown exists? And um, um, And what I was arguing uh, last time, or I guess the time before last, is that the answer to the question, what is this I that I have now proved exists, is itself has to be read out of the cognitive argument, right? Like there's, there's nowhere else to get the list. <laughs> so basically, you know, one or the other of these, it's going to start from the, the premise is going to be there exists a being that's capable of carrying out this argument. <laughs> um, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm trying to actually already trying to make more plausible what I just said about the mark being the work itself. So in other words, when the meditator says, well, I clearly have an idea of an infinitely perfect being, that itself should be um, like just a rephrasing somehow of that I'm a doubting being. Um, I want to
Oh, I see. I changed my notes at the last second. Now forgetting what I did, but okay, now I remember. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, so but actually, I'm going to change my thing again. <laughs> um, so, I think if you look at Descartes' brief summaries of how, so the actual proofs of the third meditation are long and complicated, especially the first one. So, right, that is, the first one is the one that works with the fact that I have an idea of a perfect being. And from the existence of that idea, tries to show that the perfect being exists. The second one works from, it's almost the same, but the second one works from the existence of me as someone who has an idea of a perfect being and says, someone who has that idea couldn't exist unless a perfect being exists. Um, so the first one is the really long one, and the second one is much shorter towards the end. Um, but there's shorter summaries of how the whole thing is supposed to work. Um, so, like, one is in the principles of philosophy. Um, uh, down somewhere, but I think it's on page 116. Oh, here we go. It's on page 167. So it's one principles of philosophy 120. Um, now it is certainly very evident by the natural light that a thing which recognizes something more perfect than itself is not the source of its own being. Um, for if so, it would have given itself all the perfections of which it has an idea. Um, that's maybe a little bit too short to make sense of. I also feel like that's specifically a version of the second proof more than the first one. Let me therefore read the summaries at the end of the third meditation and the beginning of the fourth meditation. Um, is it 120 as in 120? No, no, 120 as in number 20. One. Yeah. Um, it's on page 167 in this book, but, um, all right. Um, so here's one. This is towards the end of the third meditation. When I turn my mind's eye upon myself, I understand that I am a thing which is incomplete and dependent on another and which aspires without limit to ever greater and better things. But I also understand at the same time that he on whom I depend has within him all those greater things, not just indefinitely and potentially, but actually and infinitely, and hence that he is God. The whole force of the argument lies in this. I recognize that it would be impossible for me to exist with the kind of nature I have, that is, having with me the idea of God, were it not the case that God really existed. Um, um, and here's the beginning, here's towards the beginning of the fourth meditation. And when I consider the fact that I have doubts, or that I am a thing that is incomplete and dependent, then there arises in me a clear and distinct idea of a being who is independent and complete, that is, an idea of God. Right? So I think that last formulation is the clearest. It's like the, 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 the thought is that knowing myself to be incomplete and imperfect, that is, to desire something which I don't have, um, uh, in, involves in itself an idea of perfection. That thinking of myself as imperfect is 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 think first thinking perfection and then thinking negation of that. Yeah. So all of this comes from a rule, right? Which I think he also states in both these places that. Um, so like the less perfect must come from the more perfect. 
and not the other way around? Yeah, and I'm not getting to that part of it quite yet, right? Yeah. Because I mean, because here I'm just talking about like, how do I know I have an idea of infinite perfection? Well, I just that rule is essentially from Aristotle, right? Yeah, or I mean, I guess it's in Plato too, right? It's, I mean, it's, yeah. I mean it's, it's, it's similar to all of that. It's also similar to Plotinus, right? Yeah. I'm just thinking like that's not, Descartes doesn't really explain why he believes it, and I'm assuming that's because it's kind of already in all these guys. He does, no, he does explain something about why he believes it, right? Uh, uh, but um, I mean, and I think, uh, I can give me maybe a fuller explanation of why he would believe it. And it might not be exactly the same reason that Aristotle believes it. Um, it's, you know, it's because the rationalist idea of causation is just like the rational idea of inference. In fact, it's difficult to tell the difference between the two. <laughs> but somehow it has to do with, you know, a is the cause of B if um, the idea of B involves the idea of A. That is, that's what it means to think of B as caused by A. But if you say that if you say A causes B, but you don't see any connection between the, your your conceptions or ideas of B and A, then you don't know what you're talking about. Think is how rationalists would look at this. Like he would reject the idea of like spontaneous order, right? That something perfect could emerge by free chance from an imperfect process. Well, um, I mean, obviously, he would. He, he knows that if you have a six-sided die and you throw it three times, it might come up six up. <laughs> right? That is. Well, yeah, like, not like a slightly grander scale. Right. Right. No, but what I'm saying is that, like, this can't rule that out. So we have to we have to think carefully about. It. Um, but I mean, it's a good question. It's like that's my big confusion with this group of God. That's why I haven't queued up for baptism. It's like, why couldn't something perfect come from something imperfect? Well, so I mean, like I said, I think if if you were to decide to convert to Christianity because you read the third meditation, that would probably be a big mistake, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like even if you found the arguments uh really convincing right because it certainly doesn't prove anything about no religion right <laughs> you know so uh um but uh um i mean yeah maybe So the question, so like um, you have to say which things are on different levels of perfection. Yeah. yeah. Right. So like if you say to Descartes, um, um, and remember Descartes probably thinks or thinks that probably animals are just mechanisms. Right. So that actually, even though the meditator seems to suggest otherwise in this passage of the third meditation, um, uh, I think, you know, Descartes' view is that an animal, Descartes' considered view is that an animal doesn't contain some degree of perfection that's greater than an inanimate thing. So you can't prove the existence of God from the existence of something that you oh. think of God. Right, like an animal. Which, which, according to Descartes, can't think at all. I, I, I mean, according to Spinoza, 
everybody thinks of God, it's no matter how simple. <laughs> what? It like almost per, like contains a type of this absolute perfection. Well, it it has it. It, it's the intellect and the will working together, right? It has the desire for perfections that it knows it doesn't have. And then, um, like thinking on that side, I was thinking, is the his idea coming from like God is this absolute, and then falsity is like everything other, and then there is no previous thing other than this absolute. There's no binary. It's just like a, a gradient of falsity and right. truthity. Other than that, yeah, I mean, you're like you're 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 supposed to be able to prove that there can only be one perfect being. Descartes doesn't go into that because it's like people are so familiar with proofs like that. But um, there's no like perfect falsity then or something. That's what well, I was wondering. Nothing. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, that's nothing but, is not falsity. Right. Okay. So I mean, this is something we should discuss when we just talk about the fourth meditation. Unfortunately, there won't be enough time for the fourth meditation because one of the things I have to do is put it together with the sixth meditation. Mm -hmm. But oh well, anyway, but right. So in other words, if you just say to Descartes, look, here's a, a theory I have of how if like bodies, and you know, he's familiar with this type of theory because the ancient atomists said this. But they, I mean, they didn't have Darwin's key idea, <laughs> which is why Aristotle was able to refute them, right? But if, if if you say, look, I have this theory according to which if you shake up a whole bunch of tiny bodies, um, you know, eventually you should expect to see adaptation. You, you should expect to see things that look like animals and plants. Doesn't that refute your view? And I think Descartes would say, well, no, because uh, like those tiny bodies you started with had the same degree of perfection as the animals you made up with. Um, I mean, to, to that, I'm I'm a little worried about that because I'm because what you're what you're what you're saying is weight isn't order of perfection. Um, and you know, but I think you could think of it as perfection without thinking of it as a degree of reality, which is what we're really talking about here, right? So like a circle, perhaps in some sense is more perfect than a triangle, according to some scale of perfection, right? But maybe a circle is more perfect, but, but that doesn't mean that a triangle can't turn into a circle. <laughs> <laughs> Which, yeah, well, I mean, that of course True. also is a problem. I mean, homogenous. True. Right. Well, so, so this is more order than, yeah. yeah. But I say, well, I'm going to say, but then yeah. trying to yeah. actually fit better. Yeah, I mean, so, so, yeah, so this is another problem with scales of perfection, right? It, 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 when you think about it a little bit, it quickly starts to seem like it's uh, purely subjective. And I mean, look at it in yeah. different ways. Yeah. There are layers of perfection, which are the same as exactly. the layers of how real things are. Right. That's it's also different. kind of Aristotelian, right? Yeah, or like, it's more Neoplatonic. But I mean, it, it, in medieval Aristotelianism, they yeah. call it the great chain of being, right? I don't know if the term great chain of being is uh, Maybe actually right. used in medieval philosophy or not. That's a good question. But mm -hmm. no, I mean, so Neoplatonists. And Aristotelian, well, I mean, it's based on the, that thing in Aristotle about the different senses of being and substance is being in the primary sense. It's right. based on that. And on the other hand, it's based on the thing that Socrates sometimes convinces people of, that there's a realm of true being and that down here is like not true being, it's mere becoming or whatever. But it, yeah, it turns into uh, like a whole complicated system of different degrees of reality. Descartes is assuming that you're familiar with that. Yeah. This is a completely unrelated question. But um, in terms of the first proof of, right, like holding this idea of a perfect being, uh, the meditator holding this idea of a perfect being in their head, if um, the meditations go on to prove um, that the senses are reliable um, and therefore we can sense other people with other minds. Um, how do you contend with this idea that other people have an idea of a perfect being, but you wouldn't be able to prove 
that they have the same idea of a purpose. Or do you know what I'm? Yeah, I, I I know what you're saying. The, the idea is supposed to be that they're that that you know. The idea of a perfect being is the is the being that has all perfection. So there's only one. So there's only one, right? Okay. Um, okay. The I get that. Terms that you used in terms of like using the same word and it has different meanings, or one word that's like the true form of it. Well, I forgot. And what? Well, who read that in the first? You mean univocal and equivocal? Yeah. Something more similar to that in terms uh, of what that may have been. Like. Yeah, but it's supposed to be. I mean, so like. Um, Hutt discusses this in the part of the first critique on transcendental theology, uh, the ideal of pure reason, right? He says, there's this one, there's among the ideas, there's one idea that reason says to itself, not only represents a real being, but, but a, a real, um, or not only is an objectively valid concept that could be used to represent objects, but as an individual concept that represents exactly one object. Mm -hmm. And that's the idea of infinite perfection. Then a person that, you know, attacks that and says there's a transcendental illusion there. But yeah, so so that's the thought. Um, uh, I mean, I think the, the bigger problem is how do you know that other people have an idea of the existence of God? Well, I mean, if they're able to receive the meditations, then they do. Mm -hmm. But um, you don't know. Because he also has that all part about not all can. Yeah, that not everybody <laughs> can do it, or not everybody should, because the um, yeah. Although like remember the, what I pointed out about that. Whatever. Yeah, it reminds me. Mm -hmm. This is kind of like maybe a tangent into like historiography, but it reminds me of a point I heard made once about um, Martin Luther, which is, and I know that the card is a, a Catholic, but he's doing kind of a very Protestant thing of like spending a lot of time wrestling and agonizing with his concept of God and the idea that that was something believers should do emerged kind of for a select minority in the transition to modernity and like throughout the middle ages for like peasants and even really for lords believing in god didn't really mean you had to do all this wrestling it meant you went to mass and did the saints days and like yeah. the idea of having to do this meditation is like a new thing that emerges for a specific kind of new social stratum and it isn't even like yeah. that. I mean, that may be true, but but re, I mean, remember that like remember what Socrates' relationship to God is. I you know that story is Socrates spends his whole life testing what the oracle yeah. said, right? Yeah. Um, so that that it has other roots in the philosophical tradition. And as far as it being Protestant, I just read a paper um, which. That someone said, "How hey, you should look at this paper since you're teaching Descartes," um, claiming that the meditations is really based on uh, stuff written by Teresa of Avila. <laughs> um, I I think there probably is an interesting comparison to make between them, but I think that claims in this paper are exaggerated. But anyway, so right, so that so there's a Catholic version of this too, and you know, and. As I pointed out before, there's the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, and there's, I mean, right. yeah, there's there's a lot of things behind this, I, you know. Um, but that doesn't, I mean, what you're saying probably has something to it as well. I, but anyway, uh, I'm thinking about why does he say not everyone should do this? Well, yeah, so I, I tried to explain that too, right? They, they, he, he's trying to say, I mean, well, that is it's 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 not clear, but it's um something between he really thinks not everyone should do it and he's warning people and he doesn't want to be condemned like Galileo was condemned and they told Galileo was okay as long as he didn't teach. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Well, yeah. I I was saying that he that yeah. 
but I was saying that that really it's you know when you if you actually understand it, the the tricky thing about it, on either way of understanding why he did it, is that a reader who actually understands it will find that it doesn't apply to them, right? Like as soon as you understand what he's saying and why he he told you why it couldn't apply to him, and the same thing will happen to you. <laughs> What was there much like church condemnation of this of Descartes? Yeah, because like I'm not Catholic, but I went to Catholic school. It doesn't like it. No, Descartes didn't really get in trouble. Feels very orthodox to me. It doesn't seem. Uh, well, I don't think it's orthodox, but I, I I don't think Descartes Descartes didn't get in trouble. He was, you know. This doesn't seem like something the Pope would mind me. Then. Like well, that but you know, I mean, the present Pope for sure wouldn't mind you. <laughs> this but uh and the previous pope or no i guess was it benedict or was it the well, one of them the yeah no but i think it was the one before him who was an expert on husserl or was it benedict i don't remember yeah. anyway <laughs> uh benedict was a, an expert on classical piano Ooh. All right. Anyway, this is way outside my area of expertise, such as it is. So we should bring, and also we're running out of time. So we should come back to talking about Descartes. Um, so, uh, um, right. So, so like the basic way. Yeah. So this was about why you might think that that a. Uh, um, a cause couldn't be less perfect than its effect because you have to be able to derive everything in the effect from something in the cause. Otherwise, you're not thinking of a cause. You're just thinking of two things that happen after each other, but you didn't see any connection. Right? So this is a rationalist way of thinking about causation as opposed to, obviously, an empiricist way where you think, well, what could you have to go on other than what they come after one comes after the other? <laughs> right. So, but in any case, um, so getting back to the third meditation proof. So um, um so what I'm suggesting is that it really like um the whole thing is supposed to already be contained in the cogito. Like you're supposed to, at that moment of doubting, you were entertaining the idea of an infinitely perfect being. That just has to be kind of brought out. Um, um, and like, and that's what we need here, right? Like, if there's a further step beyond the cognitive, then we have to add, we would have to ask. What justifies that step? And um, this is what's called the Cartesian circle. It seems like the third meditation is supposed to justify all further steps, right? Like that's why we needed the third meditation, or I erased this, but that's why we needed it before we could get to the fifth meditation, right? Because we need to eliminate that very slight metaphysical doubt that I could go wrong every time I add two plus three. And the answer is gonna be that that would be inconsistent with God not being a deceiver. Fourth meditation obviously is necessary in between to explain which things are inconsistent with that and which are not. <laughs> right? But that that that's the basic um that's the basic plan. So, but if the third meditation itself involves, as it seems to be, a long, complicated argument then it seems like we need that principle of God not being a deceiver before we can we have it. So as I said, that's what's known as the Cartesian circle. Um, Descartes himself says something about it in the objections and replies, but although it's interesting, it doesn't seem to be sufficient. I mean, um, he basically says, uh, I need to invoke the existence of God only because that is, this is when I'm thinking of something that I clearly and uh, distinctly perceive, I can't doubt it. 
so I don't. <laughs> but uh, but the problem is afterwards, I all I do all I have is the the memory that I once clearly and distinctly perceived it, and that's what I need the guarantee that God is not a deceiver to back that up. Um, which, as I said, is interesting, but it doesn't seem like when you when you read the third meditation proof, as I said, it's long, <laughs> and you have to remember the parts that came before. So, um, so like there should be a way of condensing it to kind of like one sentence and showing that that sentence is just a restatement of the cogito. And I'm I'm kind of arguing that, I mean, so like I I was first was was kind of attacking the part of how do I know that I have this idea, an idea of infinite perfection, and Descartes' answer is that, again, at least as I am understanding it, that doubting that is wanting to know things that I know I don't know, <laughs> um, is. Uh, is having the idea of an infinitely perfect being. <laughs> right? That combination of infinite desire for perfection and, and finite perfection, <laughs> um, which is essential to doubting, is having the idea of an infinitely perfect being. And in addition, what he was saying there in that, those summaries at the end of the third meditation, beginning of the fourth is, it's having the idea of an infinitely perfect being on which I'm dependent. Um, and the, you know, the basic reason that this is the idea of a being on which I'm dependent, I think is, that it's supposed to be contained again in the fact that I'm doubting that I couldn't have caused myself to exist. Um, and, you know, so there's kind of a shortish, at least, argument on this uh, towards the end of the third meditation. Um, Why don't they have like a running page head for cursor to know which one you're in? This is a good question. This is yeah. a line that also um, So here we go. This is towards the bottom of page 95. It's AT page 48. Yet if I derive my existence from myself, then I should neither doubt nor want nor lack anything at all. For I should have given myself all the perfections of which I have any idea. And thus I should myself be God. And then he goes into a question, well, maybe some of the perfections are harder to, to give myself than others, and I was only able to give myself these. Um, and he says, well, um, none of them seem any harder to achieve. And if any of them were harder to achieve, now harder to achieve means like harder to bring into existence out of nothing. <laughs> Right, that's what makes this plausible. Like, obviously, it's harder to be to add twenty two and thirty seven than it is to add two and three. But like, is it harder to bring a being that can do one into existence out of nothing than it is to bring a being that can do the other into existence out of nothing? And it doesn't seem like it is. Right? I mean, they they both seem totally beyond me. Of course, <laughs> that's supposed to be the point, but. Um, uh, so wait, I lost my page again. Oh, oh, here we go. Um, none of them seem any harder to achieve, and if any of them were harder to achieve, they would certainly appear so to me if I had indeed got all my other attributes from myself, since I should experience a limitation of my power in this respect. Um, So again, like all I know about myself is that I'm doubting, that I desire certain perfections, um, that uh, 
and I have others, and I haven't been able to give myself the ones that I desire but don't have. Um, um, like, what is my power? <laughs> right? Like, my power is the power to desire these perfections or something like that. Um, uh, um, my my power is my power is the power to resist the deceiver, right? Like that's the only power I know that I have. Um, if like so, I know exactly what that power is sufficient for. That's the one thing I know. <laughs> so I know exactly what that power is sufficient for. Um, I would have to know if that were a power to cause some perfections to come into being out of nothing and not others. I think that's the argument. Um, I mean, it's, uh, so again, when you put the pieces together, it's like, again, the, like the mark is the work. <laughs> the, the being a doubting thing is having an idea of an infinitely perfect being that you depend on for your existence. Um, and um, um, and it, it turns out Um, right, so like um, at the beginning of the third meditation on page 87, in this, that's AT 35, in this brief list, which is basically the same list from the second meditation, in this brief list, I have gone through everything I truly know, or at least everything I have so far discovered that I know, right? So the process of the third meditation is then going to be to discover that in knowing that, I also already knew something else. And in a sense, I knew that first, even though I didn't come to recognize that I knew it first, because the idea of infinite perfection is prior to the idea of imperfection, according to Descartes. That's supposed to be evident. I mean, that's exactly what empiricists are going to argue the opposite side on, right? And say, no, it's, we have the idea of finite things and based on that, we build up an idea. Um, so there's a whole discussion of this in Locke and whatever, but um, in any case, I hope at least you can see why someone would think that, that the idea of imperfection is the idea of perfection plus negation. Um, Okay, so that's like my summary of how the third meditation proof is supposed to work. Um, other questions? Yeah. So at one point in in so I think it's in meditation five. Yeah, it is when Descartes is like trying to show that if I can have a clear and distinct objective idea of a thing, then it must have a formal existence which corresponds to that and matches it more or less. He says, like, not only does this apply to things that I think I've sensed with the senses, but also just things I can like conceive of and see that they make sense, like a triangle. Would that mean that he groups like the mathematical object of triangle with like res extensa, like with physical substance? Like when he's talking about physical substance, that doesn't just include like triangular objects, but also triangles as a, a set, as a, as a genus? Oh, okay. And up to that last sentence, I thought I understood what you were talking about. Now I'm not sure. So, I mean, so, so like what we were talking about, no, no, I don't think you are mistaken. It's just, I, I think I might have misunderstood, but like what I thought you were talking about was something like, you know, um, do we treat the idea of a whatever this is, parallel or pipette, or <laughs> the word for that shape is. Yeah. Um, that, uh, that is, right, anyway, do, like, do we treat the geometrical yeah. uh, parallel pipette as of the same kind as an, as an actual body that has that shape? 
Like, and, but, but the answer, so let me just finish answering that. So the answer is, according to Jake there is no difference between those two things, right? That's what I was talking about before, right? Like it only has shape and extension. Um, you create more kind of shape? Yeah. So this, I mean, if you accept that, then that resolves various questions in the philosophy of mathematics, right? Yes and no, because I think you were also asking, but the, at the end, I thought you were asking about the, the relationship between general ideas of bodies and ideas yeah. of particular bodies, right? Remember, the meditator says, like, um, general ideas seem to seem to be more confused, and I'm going to start with a piece of wax, which is an individual. Mm -hmm. um, but is that the meditator speaking for Descartes? considered opinion? Probably not, right? But he probably thinks the general ideas are clearer mm -hmm. than the particular ideas. Um, so, um, but, um, but not because, I mean, so he's not a Platonist in the following sense. He doesn't think that general ideas represent special general objects. Yeah. So uh, um, rather, you know, in some way or other, general ideas are ideas that represent together a lot of possible individual objects, right? So he's um, um, so he's so therefore he's not going to have the question, is the general triangle more perfect than any individual triangle because there is no general triangle. There's a general idea of triangle. There's no general triangle. No, the general idea. And all those other ones are not something over our different shapes would be like just angle, right? And then angle with lines. Yeah, so, uh, there's uh, various different levels of, of general ideas, obviously. But um, then ultimately, the general idea comes back to, right, is raise its hands up, which is less perfect than this God hands, which is less perfect than God. Yeah. Uh, he, so he, even the most perfect triangle isn't as perfect as the soul. Yeah, although he doesn't really put a lot of emphasis on that, but I think it's true and it's going to be important in the sixth meditation and exactly what way it's true. Um, but he, you know, like unlike uh, most Platonists, he doesn't spend a lot of time explaining why the body is more perfect, is less perfect than the soul. Um, they're just two different types of substance. Most of the times how he talks about them. Um, okay, so there's only 10 minutes left. Uh, I have to decide whether to discuss the fifth meditation further or to, dis to discuss ideas and formal reality and that stuff. And I think I'm going to choose the latter just because, although they're both difficult, I feel like the ontological proof is actually somewhat easier to understand than the than that apparatus, which he like assumes that you know those words. Um, so, um, um, and I mean, they're both going to be important going forward, but. Oh, well, maybe I'll get a chance to discuss the ontological proof more when we get to Leibniz's version or whatever. Um, so, um, um, right, so what is an idea? So, like, an idea is a thing. Right, it's a being that exists. What kind of thing is it? Well, it's not a substance. It's a mode of a substance. What substance is it? It's a mode of a thinking substance, right? So here's race cogitans, thinking substance. And An idea is a mode that inheres in a thinking substance as its subject, right? It is in a subject. Um, so 
like so far, that's just like a shape, right? Like here's an extended substance, race extensa, and here's a shape. Shape is a mode that inheres in an extended substance as its subject. However, an idea also has this other thing, <laughs> namely that it's about something. A shape doesn't have this, right? So an idea is about something, and we call the thing it's about its object. So, like, I mean, there's another way we use the term object now, where, where it's basically just a synonym for thing or being, right? Like you say, oh, I, here's an object. <laughs> How many objects are on this table or whatever, right? And in that sense, uh, what? No, I was counting them. Oh, counting them. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I don't, it depends on what you count as different objects, but, right. <laughs> but, um, Right, so in that sense, object is an absolute term, like something's either an object or it's not, and I guess it always is. <laughs> it's a transcendental, because it's a synonym for thing. But in this sense, object, and this is the older sense, <laughs> and the stricter sense, in this sense, object is a relative term, right? When you say something is an object, you have to say, object of what? <laughs> Object is in like the grammatical usage, right? So, the grammatical usage is related to this use of object, yeah. as is the grammatical use of subject. But and also when you say like um, the object of our plan is right, that's that's this use of object. So um, when uh, when any of these people uh, up through Kant at least talk about objects, they Hegel too. I don't know exactly when our use of object starts to creep in. <laughs> but when any of these people think about object, they're talking about the object of something. It's the object typically of an act of the mind or a faculty of the mind that is the potential to have a certain act of the mind. That is, when I say act, I mean something that's actual that's in the mind, <laughs> right? Like this idea. Right, so this is the type of thing that has objects. Um, um, so therefore, um, an idea like a shape has a certain kind of, it's a thing, right? It's a race, so it has a certain realitas has a certain um, uh, set of perfections that make it what it is, <laughs> something like that, right? Um, and uh, those, wh what is its realitas? Its realitas is its existence as um, a mode in a thinking thing as a subject. So you can also call this its subjective perfection or something like that, right? Where here subjective doesn't yet have our special sense of being like, this is where it's starting to get it, but it's still in the future when it's gonna get it, right? Here subjective doesn't have our special sense of meaning like special to a thinking thing or something like that. Because this also has a, has a subjective reality as existing in this subject. And as far as this subjective, or, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll explain an example, and know why you can also call it formal. But as far as this subjective reality goes, all ideas are on the same footing, Descartes says, right? They all have the same degree of perfection. They're modes of a thinking thing. But they have different objects. And their objects have, may have, may differ among themselves in degree of being. Um, 
Now, I mean, once you start talking about ideas and the objects, there's there, there's always a problem, which is that I may have an idea whose object doesn't exist, <laughs> right? But how does it still have that object? So, like, this is something that people worry about a lot in the Middle Ages. Um, and, um, and it's also the thing that was like bothering me before about like, in what sense do we prove that triangle is a true idea or a real idea? There may not, there may not be any perfect triangles. What are we proving? Right. So, so, so the, the basic like medieval solution to that is to say, well, um, um, you know, if the idea is successful, then it has an external object <laughs> that's actually there, right? But like the the reason it can be successful, the reason it's about this object is that there's already a kind of image of that object in the idea. Um, so, um, there's like an inexistent object in the idea for representation. Um, and that's what enables it to be about something if the right thing is found. <laughs> I have like two minutes left. Um, so, um, So we can say that the idea, in addition to its subjective reality, has a certain objective reality, right? And, and this is tricky because we tend to think of objective reality, and there's a reason for it, because it, of this external object, like we tend to think of objective reality as like a lot of reality, <laughs> like it's objective, right? But here, objective reality is less reality. Right, like, so in other words, if I have an idea of a chimera, and supposing a chimera is a possible kind of thing, and I have a clear and distinct idea of one, both of those are maybe questionable, but anyway, like if I had an idea of a chimera, um, so there is no chimera that has actual existence, or as Descartes says, formal existence, right? So like, Here's the idea of a horse, and here's the idea of a chimera. All right, so the idea of a horse is an actual horse. Um, this horse has formal reality. That is, or maybe I should say, this is the formal reality of a horse. <laughs> Formal reality, as Descartes often says, he sometimes puts these together, just means actual reality, right? So the formal reality of a horse means like there actually is such a thing, a race as a horse, it has formal reality. In my idea though, it has objective reality. In my idea, there's like objective reality of a horse. My idea of a chimera, Right. Anyway, that's I don't know. Anyway, so the chimera has objective reality in my idea, but there's no there's no chimera with formal reality. The the point of the third meditation proof is to show that if there's an idea with in, that with infinite objective reality, then there must be something with infinite formal reality. Right. That is, if I have an idea such that what has objective existence in my idea is infinitely perfect, then this can't happen. It has to be like this. Um, obviously, since I'm out of time, I won't have. 
I can't say anything about the details of that. <laughs> but I do just, I want to say one other thing, which is that if you think about this relationship here and you kind of turn it over, you'll see that this is the same as a like neoplatonic relationship between a higher level of being and a lower level of being. This is an image of this. Um, and when Descartes talks about formal reality, I mean, about eminent reality. So eminent means high, right? When, when Descartes talks about eminent reality, he's talking about something even higher than this relative which, to which this is just an image. So like God, for example. <laughs> all right, but that's all I have time to say. Um, and I'll see you next week.